welcome everyone. Um, I hope to see you at future events as well. This one's always a popular one because, um, because of Ben. And uh, if you go to SoCal Tech, uh, you know that Ben uh, has probably one of the best networks in Southern California. He breaks a lot of news about startups and has this, uh, this view of what's going on uh, in our area that's, uh, that's really unique and insightful. And I, I look forward to this talk uh, every year. I think last year, Ben, you were like deathly ill. You were really sick, and um, uh, hopefully, you're in better shape. Uh, you're better shape this year. Uh, yes, for sure. Healthy. <laughs> because now I worry every time I hear someone's sick. Uh, but um, I'm Ben. I'm really look, I'm looking forward to to hearing your talk. And the floor the floor is yours. Great, thanks. Uh, I'll uh, share my screen here in a second. Uh, the year before, actually, uh, funny enough, uh, it was like a, a massive uh, rainstorm or something. <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny. Um, good. Well, I, I'm here to talk about um, Southern California's technology world and uh, the year that was, or as Mike said, uh, was not. And so thank you very much for having me again. Um, my intent is to have this a little bit of a conversation. I know there's uh, a bunch of uh, investors and service providers who are living this every day. So definitely uh, would love to have people's comments. Um, so let's see here, screen sharing. Uh -oh. Well, let's try. Uh... So first uh, for the folks who haven't uh, seen SoCal Tech, um, go to socaltech.com. And we do run news every day and just to self plug on this. And we've been doing uh, interviews with folks, uh, try to get entrepreneurs, so particularly those who have been angel and venture funded. So if you are in the audience and uh, have been angel or venture funded, we love talking to everyone. It doesn't have to be anything particular about news, but uh, just a profile so people get to know you. So, uh, I, and I'll put my contact info on the last slide. So feel free to, to uh, uh, email or call me or 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 whatever. So, um, uh, we also have uh, new video interviews. Uh, they're a little bit paused, obviously, because of the pandemic. Um, but I'd like to get these started uh, again soon. Uh, just uh, finding that uh, some video is good for folks to get to know people, and uh, you can look at our others there. Uh, again, uh, we'll probably restart these as soon as uh, uh, people start meeting again. Uh, there's also a map of companies. So I know sometimes there's students or other folks who are looking for jobs. Uh, there's actually a map of all the companies in the area uh, that you can get to. Uh, there's a database behind that, which is membership. Um, but at least you can have an idea of where things are, where the companies are. Uh, the long story behind this is this is actually how I started my website uh, forever a year Forever years ago, <laughs> I, I, I like to say uh, a thousand internet years ago, so I was actually looking for a job in the Caneo Valley and I started coming up with a list of companies and uh, put it up on the web and uh, people started hitting it. And uh, uh, funny enough, I started getting emails from CEOs and venture capitalists about adding their companies. And so that's how so Caltech started. So there's a map up there. You can go browse for that if you're interested. Um, so let's talk about this year. Um, and I think uh, everyone knows the big issue this year is the pandemic. And uh, what I specifically wanna talk about is how did that impact the technology world and how did that impact the technology world here in Southern California? And I cover from Santa Barbara to San Diego in terms of what's going on. And you know how, 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 did, uh, how did companies do? Um, who were the winners? Uh, who are the losers? And interestingly enough, I, I've been tracking the pandemic stuff actually early. Um, uh, I pay, given that I'm in the news business and technology news, I actually happen to track a lot of other parts of what's going on in the world. And uh, I saw what was going on in, in January, the first week of January, and I was scratching my head going, uh-oh. And uh, uh, it turns out we had quite an uh-oh. So <laughs> anyway, um, so we'll talk a little bit about the, the impact there. And uh, obviously I think everyone here, since we're sitting here on Zoom, kind of understands what the issues are. 
Um, you know, the, the impact of the pandemic on work and startups, uh, there's just so much going on. And, and you guys don't need to, to uh, have anyone explain uh, how hard it is to get business done when you've got kids at home, uh, people have to deal with childcare and school, um, health issues and worries, and, and hopefully uh, uh, none of you have had to deal with, with uh, COVID or if you have, you uh, had things have worked out, but uh, you know, it's very hard in that environment for anything to get done uh, work, much less funding and startups and investment. And so uh, everything that you've seen yourself personally, I'm sure, uh, has been uh, a big impact on the startup world. And, and I've talked to quite a few startups and investors, and they all have the exact same problems everyone else here has, which is as soon as uh, things started getting locked down and uh, everyone's worried about health issues, you know, stuff doesn't happen. And so that, um, uh, to, to me, actually, it felt a lot like after 9-11, and I've been doing this technology news for quite a while, and it was definitely one of those things where, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a big pause in what's going on. Uh, in addition to just the personal issues, of course, remote access, um, was a big issue and uh, particularly at the beginning. So I don't know how many of your companies uh, and, and, or personally had to deal with a lot of the, can we work remotely and how do we work remotely? Um, so that's an interesting discussion. We may maybe uh, have, have some folks chime in there uh, a little later. Uh, and then also just whether or not you can work remotely or not. Um, you know, if you're a software engineer, obviously it's really easy, but if you've got a factory to run um, if you've got uh, uh, people who have to gather, then obviously that changes the, the, uh, what happens. So uh, everyone, I think, understands the issues, but uh, just as a, uh, a background on how that impacts startup and work. And, and it's all the same issues, but it's you know, kind of honed in on, on how, how do you get um, business done? How do you get investments done? So let's talk a little bit about um, investments first. So, and, and if you're a uh, venture investor, feel free to, uh, to, to chime in on this. Um, uh, I, I talked to a lot of startup entrepreneurs and investors, and this is what I gathered as we went into the year, right around March, when, when things started getting locked down and people realized how big of a deal uh, the pandemic was. Uh, the, I would say every single investor I talked to um, whether they were um, here or elsewhere, was went immediately into portfolio triage mode. And what I mean by that is they said, hey, we have a big, huge change in the world. What do we need to do? And they said, do we need to uh, put more money into a company to make sure that they survive longer? Uh, do we need to... Uh, uh, do we need to shut down the company? Because, you know, all of a sudden some startups are no longer uh, going to be viable. Uh, and really it, is, it was a whole uh, time of figuring out what to do with your startups. And, and as everyone knows, when you invest in a company, you're burning money every month. And so uh, the, the equation was really, you know, how, how much longer is this thing going to last? And I think everyone understood it was not going to be just a few months. It's going to be at least a year. And now we're, now, now we're looking at, you know, maybe a couple of years. Um, so how do you get your companies to the end of this in the right shape and growing? Um, or do, we, do you just uh, uh, cash in your chips and, and say that's, that's it? So that was where... Um, all the investors I talked to were for probably the first three or four months, um, uh, very much in portfolio triage mode. Uh, the other thing that you saw happen right around March is it pretty much stalled every funding process out there, um, no matter where people were. So whether or not they were uh, early on talking to companies and entrepreneurs, or if they were uh, even farther down toward the end, um, you know, anytime there's a big world-changing event, 
uh, everyone has to recalibrate and how long it takes to recalibrate um, uh, really depends on how clear things are. So uh, I, uh, as a result, uh, and you, I'll put up the numbers here in a little bit, there were very, very, very few seed funding. So seed funding being those very first investments by angel investors and some early VCs, um, those just were not happening. And, and uh, we'll pop the numbers up here in a few slides, but uh, that market dried up. And if you remember maybe two years ago, uh, Southern California, there were seed fundings every day. There was you know, hundreds of seed fundings in, in the year and it was driving a lot of activity here in, in Southern California and elsewhere. Uh, those seed fundings are, have, have gone and I haven't seen them really come back yet. So that's kind of where we are on seed funding. Uh, there are very few series A funding. So next, the next uh, level up, um, the uh, funding also slowed down quite a bit. And those are the unproven, uh, you know, maybe they have their, their, their minimal viable product, uh, but there were not a lot of bets on, on those Series A fundings. Um, I have to say that the, the activity didn't stop because there was a lot of other activity you see, but they are all uh, later stage. So these are proven companies with markets. Um, and it was very difficult to close on investments. Uh, the entrepreneurs I've interviewed since the beginning of uh, last year after the pandemic started, basically said it was like pulling teeth. Is, very, very difficult to get things to close. And the reason why, obviously, is because uh, investors don't want to sign on the dotted line when they just don't know what's going to happen. Uh, it's been a, uh, uh, you know, just like everyone else here with trying to figure out what's going on, same thing with investors. It's if you don't know what the future brings or how long things are going to go, then it's very difficult to make a decision. So uh, some other uh, impacts uh, on the process of investment itself actually came from kind of what we're doing now, which, which is you know, Zoom meetings and that sort of thing. Uh, I call it friction and friction is always bad in the investment world. Uh, if you are an entrepreneur trying to get to an investor, uh, you don't want friction. You want to be able to meet people, shake hands, uh, sign documents, the network, and all that stuff went away. So uh, pretty much no in-person meetings. Uh, I remember in, uh, in early March before things shut down and uh, uh, looking at what was going on with the uh, COVID and I had people say, hey, well, let's get together in April. And I was going, uh, it's not gonna happen, it's not gonna happen. Um, so obviously, you know, I think we're still there. No in-person meetings. Uh, uh, you know, it's not worth the risk at this point, though, I, you know, I think some people uh, uh, are starting to say, hey, maybe we'll get close to this with the vaccine and that sort of thing, but uh, we'll see. Um, disappearing conferences, and that's a big one. Um, you know, I don't know how many people here uh, typically attend techn technology conferences, but they are really, you know, aside from people going to sessions and understanding what's going on in the world, there's a lot of networking that goes on. And that is meeting other people in your industry, uh, talking with other people, uh, you know, passing out your business card. And that really has had a big impact. Uh, I know people have tried to do that online, um, you know, with, again, with Zoom and whatnot, but that is, you know, the content without the networking. So that lack of networking opportunity is, is really made a huge difference on uh, investments. Uh, the investors I've talked to uh, are trying to make up by doing a lot of meetings and that's by zoom or by phone um, but you know the number of people you can talk to wandering around a conference uh, chatting with people uh, is you know hundreds of people versus trying to schedule a zoom meeting and oh you got to deal with uh, you know getting the kids on to school at 10 o'clock and um, uh, you know all that is is a huge amount of friction again so uh, the, the better VCs I know, investors, uh, you know, do a really good job of trying to schedule that in and try and make that happen. Um, but, you know, the, the, uh, the amount of uh, friction again, you know, it's easy to, to do an elevator pitch with someone at a conference and say, oh yeah, I'm interested, but eh, well, we'll talk later um, without spending 30 minutes. But if you're on a Zoom call, 
uh, it's likely that you feel like, oh, I can't hang up on this person because I'm not interested in this, this deal. Um, so I, I know that those, there's been some frustration there from the folks I've talked to. Um, so well, the result of all that is most of the activity you see are follow on rounds. So that is all pre-existing investments. And maybe they may be new investors in a company that's already funded, but those are referrals from another firm. Um, again, I mentioned very few uh, seed and Series A funding, so it's it's very it's a it's definitely made a huge difference. So um, let's talk a little bit about winners, and I think most of the folks here kind of understand what's been going on if you've been following it. But um, you know, the, the examples obviously are Zoom, Amazon, DoorDash. Uh, I have Disney Plus on there as well. Um, you know, those are the kinds of companies that have been the winners so far from the, the status we're in with the pandemic. Um, anything that's worked from home, the delivery folks, gaming, uh, gaming accessories, believe it or not. So everyone's been rushing for uh, better webcams and headsets and network switches and Wi-Fi, um, all that, uh, you know, all the stuff that you need to work from home uh, has been really important. Uh, anything that's an online service, so anything that you normally would try to do in the office, but now uh, because you're remote, it would be nice to have access to online. Um, remote access things. Uh, fitness, believe it or not, has been an interesting one. Uh, I guess they've uh, been having a really good, uh, uh, really, really in a big increase in business because of the same area. Uh, pets, telehealth. Uh, and then I also highlighted one, which I don't cover too much on my site, but there's been a huge rush on anything pharmaceuticals related, scientific equipment, testing uh, aimed at the pandemic. And some of that is a little frothy, but uh, those were the winners out of the, the pandemic. So um, let me uh, see here. Are there any questions before I go on? You can also type your questions into the chat box. We're keeping an eye on that too. Okay, great. Um, so let's talk about exits. So um, if you've seen my presentations from prior years, I like to run down on all the acquisitions and the IPOs. And it usually takes me a little time because you know Southern California being uh, one of the bigger uh, technology and start startup uh, industry areas, uh, always has a lot of IPOs and, and exits. And um, the traditional exits, and we'll, we'll, I'll put up a, uh, another slide on this, the SPACs later, and we can talk about that, and maybe some of the ex SPAC experts may chime in. But the traditional exits, the IPOs and acquisitions, uh, you have them on one hand this year. Um, th these are the big ones in the area, uh, good RX. Um, which is a marketplace for prescription had an IPO uh, and, and a pretty good one. Um, Signal Sciences, uh, which ha had an acquisition of $775 million. Uh, InTouch Health, which is a, a telehealth um, uh, company, $600 million. And the other two are some very small acquisitions. Uh, Love Goodlies a, was a small company and NextVR was acquired by Apple for technology. There's a few others in there, but you know, normally this is a list of, of 20 companies. And so for traditional exits this year, it just was not an exit year, not, not an IPO year, uh, not an acquisition year. Um, I, I don't have the numbers here, but uh, interestingly enough, uh, it was a company, uh, Southern California companies were very, very active acquiring other companies. So it was a buying opportunity. And I think my assessment of that is, because uh, of the economic challenges, there was a lot of people trying to move around the chips and uh, you know, either sell things that they were not interested in holding uh, or acquiring stuff that they said, hey, this is a great time to acquire it because the price will be good. So uh, there was a lot of acquisition by Southern, big Southern California companies and most of them were pretty small buys. So, but that's a tradi traditional exits, not a lot. Um, I uh, should put up the, the last year's chart, which was, you know, full up and down and a lot of great exits. Uh, this year it has been really, really minimal. Uh, 
SPAC. So uh, maybe some of the SPAC uh, folks can uh, talk about this. So this was the one area that there's a lot of activity. Um, for those who are not familiar with the SPAC, uh, it's a special purpose acquisition company where uh, a company is created and raises money on one of the exchanges um, specifically to go acquire some other company. And sometimes they know what company they want to acquire. Sometimes they go fishing around for it. And uh, these used to be called blank check acquisition companies. And this was, um, uh, I don't know what the 2020 numbers are. They're even bigger, but in uh, 2019, they were 13.6 billion. They're even bigger in 2020. Um, and Southern California companies have been piling into, into this. And, and so what this allows you to do is basically go public on a exchange without all the headache of an IPO. Um, you know, the IPO is done with a minimal amount of paperwork compared to taking your company uh, public the, the traditional way. And uh, the ones that I've got uh, uh, listed that were completed as a, a SPAC were Canoe, which is an electric car company. Um, and it's an electric car company that hasn't produced a car yet. So that tells you how this goes. <laughs> um, uh, Nuve, which is a also in the uh, electric car uh, business, uh, Romeo Power, uh, Fisker Automotive is another one, another auto company. They did they do have a vehicle, though. Um, if anyone is familiar with Fisker, uh, this is I think the third or fourth um, uh, incarnation of the same company raising money. Um, they've gone bankrupt at least once before, and 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 uh, this is the latest. Uh, Virgin Galactic, which uh, uh, launches uh, rockets into space. And then there's at least three, there's probably more uh, that are in progress or rumored, uh, including Bird, which is the scooter company in Santa Monica. Uh, Triller, which is a, a company that lets you do uh, music videos on social media. Uh, and uh, Faraday Future, which is another electric car company. So this is where most of the activity actually has been. Um, however, uh, they are uh, absolutely, um, uh, it's an interesting set of companies. And, and uh, uh, to, to me, this feels a lot like the internet bubble in terms of these companies. They tend to have a lot of uh, pizzazz, look really sexy, but they aren't necessarily making money. And uh, that is kind of what the uh, feeling is for the SPAC. So, um, you know, maybe later if uh, when we're doing the question and answers, uh, if uh, anyone wants to comment on that, that would be great. Uh, who are the losers? And everyone knows uh, in general in the, uh, in the economy, restaurants, travel, uh, commercial real estate. And the commercial real estate, actually, uh, the losses there are, a lot of them are caused by the tech industry. Um, and that's because everybody said, why do we need an office if we're doing remote work? And so anyone who could get rid of their uh, commercial real estate did, and uh, we'll see how that, how that lasts as we go forward. Um, but the local uh, commercial real estate was probably hit pretty hard. I don't have the numbers, but the, um, I know the number of startups and technology companies that let go of space uh, in 2020 was gigantic. Um, small business, uh, anything that uh, obviously has in-person contact, tourism, startups serving the above. So everybody who serves those guys was struggling a little bit. Uh, I heard some of the startups claim that they have gotten more business because of um, having to deal with uh, some of the pandemic closures and that sort of thing. Um, but I think a lot of them are handing their software for free, hoping the companies uh, last a while. And the last one on my list here, which I'll talk about separately, uh, which was the biggest loser <laughs> was uh, uh, Quibi. And maybe, uh, uh, I don't know if anyone um, uh, is familiar with this and it's kind of hard on Zoom to, to see how many people have heard of it, but uh, they uh, they were the biggest loser in so Southern California in terms of losses. Um, uh, if you want to feel good as an entrepreneur, uh, here's what they did is they raised $2 billion dollars now think about it, that's two billion with a big B, and uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg, uh, who's a Hollywood guy, which most people know, Meg Whitman, who was uh, 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 eBay for a while, and uh, 
they they came up with a lot of money and their whole idea was to create short form mobile content so that's less than 10 minutes um mobile series and they went whole hog and they just went produced tons and tons and tons of content uh they went live on april 6 2020 which was just after everything closed so imagine you and i normally would be hey well we may take a uh you know a, a commuter bus to work or a train or be flying in an airplane and i love to watch this content but of course no one's traveling on airplanes anymore uh, no, anyway so that was they were really um they had a really bad timing and then even after people went home nobody was interested in their content uh enough uh in the in the first few months so they went live on april 6th and they shut down in october which is you know six months i think um so two billion dollars and they only went for six months and then they sold all the content rights uh just a few uh weeks ago for less than 100 million dollars so that's how you turn two billion dollars into 100 million dollars so that is uh, for this year, I think it's the biggest loser. I don't know if it's the biggest loser in the time I've been following technology in Southern California, but uh, um, it's definitely a big one. So if, uh, if you're an entrepreneur, um, you, you haven't matched the a level of uh, failure until you raise $2 billion and turn to $100 million. So hopefully no one here works there and I'm going to tell them how. how uh, anyway. <laughs> um, Good. So let's talk about uh, funding. Um, th this is the list of the, the biggest funding uh, for Southern California. And I'm not going to go through this list, um, but uh, just to show you, there was investment dollars put into, into the industry this year. And uh, uh, the uh, these are all the companies. Scopely is the top one, um, which is in Culver City. They do games and uh 340 million and the biggest thing on that is you'll see the investors uh that's an indication that they expect to do an ipo or be acquired to, to raise that much money um so there was activity and uh, uh some of these made sense if you know heal heal does in-person doctor visits so another healthcare play uh, obviously that's a big thing nowadays and so that they raised 100 million dollars um uh goat which uh, actually raised some money recently um is a e-commerce firm uh on sneakers so there's there's a number of of uh of companies but they're all very late stage in terms of how much money they're raising so uh these are in reverse order because i just pulled them out of so i was sitting in the dark uh yesterday uh, because of the blackout and i don't know how many people live in the uh, ventura county area probably most of you guys so uh, uh i was sitting in the dark and i have a backup system so i had internet but uh it was uh an interesting task pulling all this stuff up so i said okay i'll just capture the screens and so they're in inverse order um so this is a seed funding so you'll see that um uh you know january march and April, there's a few announced seed fundings, and then it died until June, and then July and nothing else. So this was in 2020, seed fundings were just not there. And normally, uh, I think a few years ago, I had every, there were two or three every week from January until December. And so we, you know, the seed fundings have dried up. Um, so definitely a lost year for very early startups. Uh, series A looked a little better, but again, uh, you'll see what happens is it, in Fe February, there's a lot of stuff. Um, and then nothing happened in March because of the lockdown. And then the rest of these actually were in progress. So I've talked to a lot of these companies and it just took them a long time to finish those rounds. Because in, in March, everyone's going lockdown, lockdown, April going, oh, crud, what's going on? And so they had to really, really work hard to close it and even some of these later uh, later ones and it started back up a little bit more uh toward the end of the year right before the holidays um but uh, it was definitely a uh, a pause year for for those um uh for the series a so let's go to the next one here series b so series b are companies that are 
uh, even more established. So generally, they've they've uh, they've had uh, some some set set of success. They've got customers and they're expanding. And so those folks just had to go back to their their existing investors and uh, and raise another round. And so these you'll see the B's and the C's actually happened. And the reason why is because everyone went, hey, we need to give these companies enough money so that they can make it out of this pandemic. So the Series B, Series C rounds are very much, uh, we, we've done our portfolio triage. What are we, what are we gonna um, fund? And so these are some of them. Uh, this one's a funny trust and will. Uh, they got a lot of interest to talk to these folks. Um, because what they do is do, they do online trusts and wills and everybody's going, oh no. <laughs> it's like, well, that's a little morbid, but they got money because that's what people were interested in. Um, and uh, let's see, is there anything else? Uh, health health companies, that's uh, definitely another one. Uh, Esports, that one is not. Anyway, so that is the Bs, just so you've seen those. Um, Cs, and these are all companies that did... Um, had existing investors and uh, Series D and Series D. So these are all the ones that have had support. And um, obviously at some point, you know, they're doing well enough that people say, hey, we just keep, we just got to keep them going. So, okay, uh, let go. So thought, I would add some tips for startups who are seeking funding. And, and it's a little hard to uh, read the room through Zoom, um, but uh, you know, for folks who are startups now, uh, persistence is definitely the key because uh, there's a lot of friction right now in, in startups in funding. And so uh, you know, if, if you're gonna understand that it's probably two or three or four times harder today than it was a year ago, well, actually two years ago to get funding. Um, so per, being persistent is really key. Um, uh, B, aspirin, not a vitamin. And I don't know how many people heard me say that before, but when you are, um, when you are starting a company, there's, in a good year, you can be anything. You can, do, you can have um, almost any startup and you can get interest from investors, you can get some customers. Uh, in a hard year, uh, what I've seen through the dot-com bust and um, uh, and beyond, every time we have a, uh, a downturn, is the companies that survive and do well are the ones that you just can't do without. So if you've got a headache, you know, you'll pay anything for aspirin, but you're not going to, you know, vitamins, it's nice to have, but it's not, a, not necessary. So as much as it, you can be a company that's a something that you have to have, uh, that is more important than anything else. Uh, work your network. I know there's a there's service providers here in the room who specialize in the technology industry here. I suggest you get to know them very well. Um, uh, the the folks who are getting looks from investors are getting it by referrals mostly, and that's always been the case, but it's even more so now. Um, uh, the, the service providers who are the ones that are servicing the startups that have been funded will know the investors. They can, they, they, uh, they can make the intros uh, a lot easier than you trying to uh, you know, uh, figure things out. Uh, things coming over, you know, emailing people, your, your business plan doesn't work very well in the first place. It works even worse in a pandemic. Um, and the, the last piece of advice and I think this is really the the one that if you can do is important is if you can if you can fund your startup yourself, which is through revenues, um, or fund it by your customers. So find find the customers who will fund you because uh, the only startups I see right now who are making any headway uh, are the ones that are doing this, um, the the early ones, the seed 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 stage companies. The only ones that are doing okay because of all that um, uh, friction are the ones that are able to actually make money um, even before they've gotten funding. And so, you know, the, the investors are willing to fund companies to help you expand and grow, 
um, but they are really not, um, they, they are a lot less likely now to be making just gambles because, hey, that's a cool technology. Uh, they, they really are uh, picking, picking and choosing things a lot closer. Um, okay, so what to watch in 2021, things that I'm looking at, and I don't know the answers to this. Um, I don't know if anyone does, but when do we exit pandemic mode? Um, uh, anyone who watches the, uh, the testing and hospitalization, ICU, uh, death rates knows that we're in the worst of it right now. So uh, it's kind of hard to figure out where do we, we go from here. Um, but uh, you know, where, where are we gonna be? When do we get out of this pandemic mode? When people start thinking uh, rather than just survival from day to day, uh, what, what companies do we invest in? What is the next industry? And that sort of thing. Right now, I think we're still a little bit in the, in the oh boy, what are we doing? And uh, what's tomorrow gonna bring? Um, the uh, other things to watch, which will be a good indicator for the health of the technology industry is uh, when are the seed investments and series A funding uh, deals gonna restart? Um, when you start seeing investors making seed and series A fundings, then you'll know that their mood has shifted back into, hey, what's the, what's the next thing? How do we grow? Um, that is a market for me. And I haven't seen it yet, but um, uh, when, when that starts happening, then that's generally when the technology industry is starting to take off. Um, then the last thing is, uh, you know, how do we overcome friction? And I think, you know, obviously people getting on Zoom is one way we've done it, but are there other things we can do uh, to overcome friction for the industry in, as a whole, uh, to, to try to get more deals going and more people uh, meeting the right people. So opportunities, um, you know, even though we're in the middle of, of what has been a, uh, a very tough year and, and you know, still, still gonna be a, a tough year starting this year, is there's a huge opportunity. And having seen this after the dot-com bust, after 9-11, after a lot of things, the, the folks who win are the ones who are around during the event and figure out how to take advantage of that transition. So the transition out of the pandemic is a huge opportunity for somebody. I don't know who it is because if, if I were, I were doing that and not be talking to you guys. Um, uh, and figuring out, uh, you know, where will customers continue to transition online? You know, is, is the move to use these tools like we are now, uh, Zoom gonna be a long lasting thing or is it just a short thing? So there's, there's gonna be places where maybe people have, are, are so used to now going online that uh, there, there's a lot more opportunity. It's uh, uh, sort of like uh, when the web first came out, there was the first few things that went um, online, you know, some e-commerce stuff. and after that, everyone figure out, oh, well, hey, we can do this, the same thing uh, in this industry area, in this industry area. So uh, there's, there's opportunities like that. And I think there's still opportunities like that right now, um, uh, impacted by how, how we've been working and how people are investing in the pandemic uh, year. And uh, that, that's a good thing to do. Now, now, another thing to think about, if you're, especially if you're a startup founder, is where is there a white space that you can occupy? There's a huge advantage uh, right now, which is there's not a lot of competition. And during down years, people never think about this. They go, oh, hey, it's, it's horrible. But what market industry can you take a, a part of and have a substantial um, head start on because there's not 20 other startups doing the same thing? Uh, example, after every... Uh, after every uh, downturn, there's always some company that survived through whatever downturn it was and does really well because they started growing their business when there's nobody else there. Um, the, the, uh, there's an advantage of getting funding easily, but there's a disadvantage. So in the years when you get a lot of funding, you get 10, 10 different companies doing the same thing. And I don't remember uh, if anyone remembers uh, during the dot-com um, boom, you know, online pet stores and online groceries and all that. And uh, there's, you know, there's this big rush for a market. There's too many people. It gets crowded. It's too early and everyone fails. But in a down market uh, and 
every single time I see this, there's somebody who says, hey, I can do this. And if they're able to carve out a space, um, when, when the economy starts to recover and things start to go back to normal, uh, they're in a good spot because they're way ahead of everyone else and there's no competition. Every, every major uh, exit uh, and, and company that's really lasted uh, over the last few years I've seen has been one of those companies out of a bad year. Now, of course, it's really hard for everyone else, um, but uh, if you can figure out how to make it work, there's an opportunity. Um, I mentioned aspirin. Uh, what's a must have? Uh, it's always good to have something that people are, are willing to pay for no matter what uh, in a bad economy. economy. Um, so anyway, that's the opportunity. So um, that, and so that's about all I wanted to talk about. So I, I've got my uh, contact info here. If you've got a startup, uh, my email's there and uh, my phone number there. And uh, uh, you, if you've got other people who don't know about SoCal Tech, especially I find new founders aren't aware of us. They're only aware of stuff from Silicon Valley. Uh, let us uh, let them know. Uh, interesting uh, startups. If there are startups that you're aware of that are doing really well that just uh, haven't gotten attention and that's always the case, let me know. Uh, deals, venture funding, not everybody announces things. Uh, I'm definitely open for sponsors. So if you're interested in, in uh, letting people know that you're out there, uh, during the right now, uh, even though things are quiet, uh, I think that uh, our sponsors are being out there. People say, hey, they're still around. They're still servicing the industry. So that's a, it's a good thing. And you can also become a member and get access to our database and uh, to, to uh, all of our news stories. Some of ours are private. So anyway, um, I guess that is it. Uh, Mike, you want to see if anyone has questions? Yeah, well, we've got we've got a few in. First of all, thank you for that presentation. It's always always insightful. Um, we've got a few a few comments in the uh, in the chat box. So let's go back to SPACs. Uh, and Garrow, feel free to chime in. You 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 posted a. a, a sure, I mean, we're we're in the middle of it. Uh, uh, I mean, I'll I'll say something first generally about SPACs, and then. Uh, specifically to what I'm see we're seeing in the market now. I mean, SPAC's been around uh, almost 30 years now, had a very, very shady start, only deals that no one else would bank. So typically a lot of them went sideways. But in the last, uh, I'd say three to five years, they've become quite uh, respectable, mainstream. And uh, you know, by 2019, they're very mainstream, one of three ways to go public, either a direct listing, traditional IPOs or going public in a two-stage process to a SPAC. And last year, it just really blew up. I mean, last year, more SPACs, 250 SPACs or so went public and uh, more money raised, like $80 billion raised through SPACs relative to you had 13 billion the year before, which was their best year before, right? And uh, it's interesting because it's a structure that's very, very attractive. It works great for the selling companies. It works great for the SPAC sponsors. Uh, it works great for the IPO uh, investors. But with anything that's really good, it gets oversubscribed. And so I think uh, you're seeing a lot of abuses happening, companies going public that don't are quite on the speculative side. And last year there was just a lot of money around. Uh, and I mean, all you listed several things around uh, electric vehicle, autonomous vehicles, companies that have zero revenue in four or five years, they're going to do a billion dollar, but no revenue for next three years. And they're get, going public at 2 billion, 5 billion, 10 billion, 20 billion valuations. It's just purely speculative. And many of those will blow up. And you know, I'm sure SPACs will get a black mark again here in the next few years. Me, but uh, underneath it, things will stabilize uh, and the economics will shift a little. The economics are really attractive for a lot of the players. That's why you see so many people jumping in. 
Uh, and then for us specifically in October, we raised $115 million on NASDAQ. Uh, SPAC's name is Motion a uh, Acquisition. We're targeting transportation related tech software companies. And it's a quite interesting space. Good, good. Well, hey, th thank you very much for the updated numbers. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's definitely interesting and, and your insights are good there. Um, uh, yeah, my read on it as well is is they're a little bit oversold right now, and so it's going to be a it's going to be a punishing year for some of them. Yeah, I, there there'll be this, uh, reckoning in the next two years. Right. A lot of these companies are going to go sideways, but there'll be some very just like the internet bubble. Some very amazing Amazon and others came out of that, right? Right. Uh, right. But there a lot of companies went sideways. Yeah. You know, I, I see a question about TikTok. Uh, I think that was in reference to uh, uh, Quibi. And uh, I would say they don't compete against each other. Um, and uh, uh, I see, I'll skip over the other question here is, uh, do you think uh, without a pandemic, Quibi would have found success? Um, I personally don't think so. And the reason why is not so much the service as it was the uh, investment style. And, um, and, and and Mike can talk a little about this too, but we're we are in an interesting industry where we have both Hollywood and we have technology, and they everyone thinks that tech, technology in Southern California is Hollywood, and it's not. They're like different worlds. There's the technology investors, and then there's the Hollywood investors, and Quibi, even though it looks like a venture investment deal, is a Hollywood deal, and that means a lot of money. Uh, it's a, it's like a movie, right? They put a lot of money in and they say, Hey, we're going to get it all back. Um, which is very different than tech investors, which would have put in a little bit of money, had some milestones, made sure that the customers were signing up even with a little bit of, you know, maybe do a one series or two series. And, but no, no, they said the whole kit and caboodle let's put $2 billion in and, and see if what we get out. And obviously that's a huge risk. That's, that's the reason why. Uh, I think they they would have failed either way. Uh, it's just uh, they had a convenient uh, convenient uh, place to point to with the pandemic making it worse. Yeah, or to put a point on it, they didn't do customer discovery, <laughs> right? And they had a perfect opportunity with with the short form kind of video to try to, like you said, build build an MVP, produce some content, and uh, show it to people and see what they think, but they, they built something that nobody wanted. And like Jorge's, Jorge Mercado's comment, we, you can just watch YouTube and hit pause. So what, what's the difference? Is there, do you really need closure on a story or can you hit pause and watch it later? Uh, but we know that talking to your customers is so important in doing incremental development. I think I even saw Jeffrey Katzenberg kind of fess up to it that you know, <laughs> I, it's, a, it, it's a very expensive lesson to learn, but I think he realized afterwards that we can't apply this old school Hollywood model to, to what in, in essence is a tech company. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think they, they've learned that the hard, they should have gone to more uh, more entrepreneur speaker series because I know that you, your speakers always say that is talk to the customer before you yeah. invest a lot of money in there. So uh, yeah. Um, How about Eric's comment there about A rounds, Angel and A rounds? Do you think they're going to rebound? Yes. Um, that that's one thing I didn't mention, uh, which is there's a lot of interestingly enough in 2019 there were a lot of uh, seed stage. Um, early a Series A company uh, venture firms and funds that were started, and they have not been making investments. So uh, I, I think that there's a pent up demand. Uh, they have to somehow make investments sooner or later. Uh, they can't just collect management fees and not make investments. So I think that there will definitely be an uptick. Now, the question is when, and I'm not sure. Um, we, we talked about doing a, a, some kind of pool of like, oh, when are we going to uh, actually, you know, get people, enough people vaccinated and what. So it, there's a lot of, lot of uh, where are we in the world uh, questions there. But I think at some point, um, those investors are going to pull the trigger because otherwise they're going to have to uh, close up their funds because they, they've got money sitting there. Yeah, you know, you also, on one of your slides, Ben, you also mentioned uh, that, uh, startups should look to fund as much of, of their business as they can from their customers. 
and that's becoming a more uh, a more common way uh, to look at how you grow your business. Um, th a book I recommend, uh, it's by a gentleman uh, named John Mullins. Uh, he's a professor at London Business, London Business School, I think. He wrote a book called The Customer Funded Business. If that's a uh, something you're thinking about, it's a really good book to read. John, John's been around uh, for a long time. He tends, he tends to not be as, as well known as, as some other authors on entrepreneurship, but he tends to precede everyone by a couple of years when he writes something. Uh, so I'd encourage you to take a look at that book. Um, and then Amy Wood uh, uh, asked a question I think is somewhat related, and that's um, do you follow equity crowdfunding, Ben? And have you seen any an uptick in that kind of fundraising? Yeah, there, there's definitely been a move toward equity crowdfunding. Um, it, it's an interesting area because it it feels a lot to me uh, that they're they're on the edge of that. Well, how trustworthy are they? Um, uh, you know, some some companies have done well on, on that, um, but. Uh, I'm not sure where they sit in terms of, uh, uh, you know, if you look at over-the-counter traded companies, they feel a lot like that, where there's a lot of self-promotion and you're just not sure are they going to be able to produce product and um, you really have to rely on the, the track record. So uh, if you're an, a, a startup entrepreneur with no track record and you're trying to do equity crowdfunding, you may run into issues just because how are they going to know you are going to be able to, you know, build this company and do things. If you've done it before, if you've, you've been executive at a company, you've got some legitimate, um, uh, you know, backing that you can point to, then that you, you'll maybe have a better, better op, uh, opportunity to, to raise money that way. Excellent. Um... So I see a question from Andy Tomat about local digital health and genomics firms growing rapid, rapidly. Oh, there, yeah. is there, is that, that's a statement. Yeah, well, what's happening with, with um, it seems like in, in the Conejo Valley, we finally turned that corner. We've been waiting for forever for that biotech startup community critical mass to kind of get there. Uh, it seems like it is. Does it seem like 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 we're at a point where we're going to see an increase in the number of the number of startups and the number of fundings uh, related to biotech, uh, life science, that kind of thing? That's an interesting question. So so if anyone's familiar with the biotech industry, is they have had a big retreat in funding over the last few years, and the reason why is when you look at a, a internet startup or an e-commerce startup or something like that. And then compared against the time frame of a biotech company, it's always you know a huge order of difference of exit. Um, the so so there's a, been a big retreat. Now the difference now is there are things that uh, there are there are startups, especially in digital health, where they really are technology software deals. They don't have any approval issues. They don't have discovery issues. And so I, I think those companies are definitely on the uptick. Um, and definitely companies are, are having interesting ways of starting, uh, not so much here, but in San Diego, a lot of the investors are incubating the companies and they aren't, you know, they aren't just putting a little bit of money in They're They're picking entrepreneurs and executives out of established firms and they're putting a hundred and 200, $300 million, uh, into those companies. So that is something that's happening though. It's, uh, uh, haven't quite seen it as much here, but a little bit, but, uh, definitely. Um, then, we have one from Hovig. What's your perspective on increasing investments in SoCal and Conejo Valley startups, especially with the building Silicon Valley exodus? Yeah, so you know, there's a, there's definitely an opportunity. Um, there's always been an opportunity to to build a company, no matter where you are. Um, and, and some of the the biggest companies in technology did not come directly out of Silicon Valley. Uh, and, and I think uh, you can build a good company everywhere. Um, um, the, I like to point examples at our local companies like MindBody, which is in San Luis Obispo. And, and everyone, you know, before that, everyone said, hey, there's no technology in San Luis Obispo. And then they went their IPO. 
Um, not doing as great right now, but, uh, uh, but you know, that's one. And then um, lynda.com out of Ojai, you know, huge company and who would ever think a great company can uh, Ojai. So, you know, it, it's the, the difference uh, that, um, that, is, that is in a tech area is the networking. And so the reason why someone in Southern California or Silicon Valley, or whatever, uh, can get funding easier than somebody in Idaho is because, you know, there's usually groups and there's people nearby who you can talk to uh, who do funding for that. So um, I think we uh, do have an opportunity right now when people are, are remote to, to maybe reach more investors uh, if you can. Um, but maybe it's a wash because, you know, the deals aren't getting done quite as much. So. Thank you. Yeah. I just noticed the time, time, time flies when, when we do our retrospective, we didn't even have any time for predictions, although I'm not sure I want to predict anything about 2021. I'm, <laughs> I'm half ready to just skip to 2022. Um, so thank you all for coming. Have a good night. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks, Mike.